The Corbett Report is brought to you by you. Your support makes The Corbett Report possible. Sign up for the subscriber newsletter or purchase a DVD at corbettreport.com slash support. You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another edition of The Corbett Report. I'm your host, James Corbett, coming to you, as always, from the sunny climes of Western Japan, here on this 20th day of September, 2013. Welcome to episode 281 of The Corbett Report podcast, Solutions, Overcoming Stockholm Syndrome. Of all of the psychological states that can develop in the wake of any traumatic or abusive incident, perhaps none is as counterintuitive or therefore as fascinating as Stockholm Syndrome. Victims of Stockholm Syndrome develop compassion and loyalty towards their captors. The condition follows psychologically traumatizing situations like hostage situations and kidnappings. In fact, Stockholm Syndrome got its name in 1973 when two thieves accosted a bank in Stockholm, Sweden, taking four bank employees hostage. For six days, the prisoners were held in a bank vault, tied to explosives with nooses around their necks. During a rescue attempt, police were shocked when the captives took offense, siding with the captors. Like the Stockholm victims, People who develop this condition endure situations where they're forced to contemplate the reality of severe injury or death. In order for Stockholm Syndrome to develop, a victim must also perceive that her captors have shown occasional kindnesses. Being permitted to eat, not being punished for a so-called transgression, and even being allowed to live are all considered benevolent to someone with Stockholm Syndrome. People with Stockholm experience symptoms similar to post-traumatic stress disorder patients. They may have flashbacks, nightmares, distrust of others, and the inability to enjoy previously pleasurable activities. No one is sure why this phenomenon occurs, but it has been suggested that a victim believes perhaps unconsciously, that forming an attachment to her captor maximizes her survival. Oddly, Stockholm Syndrome doesn't resolve in tandem with the end of a hostage situation. In the 1973 bank robbing, the freed hostages remained loyal to their captors, even setting up a fund to cover the criminal's legal fees. The symptoms of Stockholm Syndrome are actually something of an anomaly. Because according to FBI reports, 73% of abduction victims show no compassion or affection for their captors. That's right. As counterintuitive as it may seem, there is a certain percentage of the population that, when placed in that traumatic abductor-abductee situation, will actually fall in love with their captor. And this is a well-documented psychological phenomenon going back at least to the 1970s, from the 1973 robbery and hostage-taking that took place at the Credit Bank in, in Stockholm, Sweden. And again, this is a very fascinating phenomenon. So let's find a little bit more perspective on what this phenomenon is and how it develops from a most unlikely source. The FBI Law Enforcement Bulletin from July 1993, which had an article on this subject that has been preserved in, of all places, the website of the United States Air Force Air University. Don't ask me the connection there, but at any rate, it's an interesting little piece that goes some way towards debunking the idea that this is a very common phenomenon, that this is something that happens in every hostage taking and the like. It, it uh, tries to downplay the, the Stockholm Syndrome as it has been played up in the media over the years and prov- uh, provides a nice trope for the uh, television programs and the like. And for more on that, you can see TV Tropes uh, website and their entry on Stockholm Syndrome. But let's read a little bit from this article from the FBI Law Enforcement Bulletin from 1993 entitled Placing the Stockholm Syndrome in Perspective. Quote, On an August morning in 1973, an escaped convict took four bank employees hostage in Stockholm, Sweden. 
For 131 hours, the hostages shared a bank vault with another convicted criminal, the former cellmate of the hostage taker, who had demanded his release from a nearby penitentiary. Despite their, despite their ordeal, after the incident, the hostages reported that they had no ill feelings toward the hostage takers and, further, that they feared the police more than their captors. Psychologists called this newly discovered phenomenon the Stockholm Syndrome. A coping mechanism also known as the Survival Identification Syndrome, the Common Sense Syndrome, or simply Transference, the Stockholm Syndrome usually consists of three components that may occur separately or in combination with one another. Negative feelings on the part of the hostage toward authorities, positive feelings on the part of the hostage toward the hostage taker, and positive feelings reciprocated by the hostage taker toward the hostage. End quote. And reading further on from that article, quote, after interviewing numerous flight attendants who had experienced the hijacking, FBI researchers concluded that three factors must be present for the syndrome to have the potential to develop. First, a significant length of time must pass. Second, the hostages and the hostage takers must maintain contact, i.e. the hostages are not hooded or isolated in a separate room. And third, the hostage takers must treat the hostages kindly, or at least not physically abuse or verbally threaten them. End quote. Well, of course, you can go and read that full article in its full context to talk about the ways that they try to downplay the phenomenon and say it's not quite as common as people like to think. But let's just dwell for a moment on those criteria that they use to describe the, the necessary conditions for this type of syndrome to occur. Firstly, there must be an extended period of time in which the abductors and abductees are in relations. There must be actual close contact between the two. And thirdly, the abductors must treat the abductees kindly, at least some of the time, at least on the surface. And with that combination, there is, again, a certain percentage of society that will actually fall in love with their captors in one form or another. Maybe not necessarily in the type of physical love or amorous love, but at any rate, a type of bonding that takes place. And again, it's a very strange phenomenon, but the question may be asked, well, what of relevance is this to what we talk about here on the Corbett Report week in and week out when we look at the bigger pictures facing society? Well, I posit to you the question, is there a societal Stockholm Syndrome taking place? Like the Stockholm victims, People who develop this condition endure situations where they're forced to contemplate the reality of severe injury or death. There are new revelations this morning involving the U.S. drone strikes program. Uh, in a 16-page memo obtained by NBC News, the Justice Department makes the legal case for the killing of American citizens overseas if they are believed to be, quote, senior operational leaders of al-Qaeda or an associated force, even if there is no intelligence indicated they, indicating they are engaged in an active plot to attack the U.S. Wow. In order for Stockholm Syndrome to develop, a victim must also perceive that her captors have shown occasional kindnesses. Being permitted to eat, not being punished for a so-called transgression, and even being allowed to live are all considered benevolent to someone with Stockholm Syndrome. On New Year's Eve in this 1800-word signing statement, the president seemed to emphasize the point, quote, my administration will not authorize the indefinite military detention without trial of American citizens. No one is sure why this phenomenon occurs, but it has been suggested that a victim believes perhaps unconsciously, that forming an attachment to her captor maximizes her survival. Would you all support the impeachment of Barack Obama? For, For what specifically? Anything. Your choice. Because I don't like his tie? Like, <laughs> that, that's not even a question. For the war in Afghanistan, yes. What about for his assassination of a U.S. citizen for speech crimes? I mean, it's a bad thing. It's definitely a bad thing. Not impeachable? If I thought it was realistic or useful to the country to unseat the president right now, especially a year before an election, like, it's a bad thing. But is it going to really benefit the country? What concrete benefits do we achieve by impeaching him? Well, we'd get a dangerous, violent extremist out of office, at least. Yeah, but what happens to the country? 
Oh yes, friends, it is my contention that there is a certain percentage of the population that very much is suffering from societal Stockholm Syndrome, and have learned to love their captors, their abductors, in the positions of political power, who have us all hostage in this societal prison that has been constructed around us, and that does not need much elaboration for my regular listeners or followers of the alternative media generally. And unfortunately, I think we've probably all encountered people suffering from this condition in our own day-to-day -day lives, the people who are un under the thrall of the politicians or the other s spokesmen and mouthpieces for political power, whether it be in the media or in the education uh, field or what have you, the people who have learned to love that servitude and take it on. And uh, yes, the phrase, uh, people can learn to love their servitude, was of course famously utilized by Aldous Huxley in his 1962 speech at Berkeley, The Ultimate Revolution, to describe a, uh, a very scientifically crafted technique for making people love their servitude. This is a very much cruder technique, but one that unfortunately is effective nonetheless, or at least effective on a certain percentage of the population who simply are susceptible to this type of syndrome. And it is, again, as I say, it's something that should probably be familiar to most of my listeners who have undoubtedly encountered someone in their life who will continue to stick up for the, the government or for Obama. Obama, or for the system in general, or for the idea of patriotism, my country right or wrong, or whatever ways in which people manifest this sick love for the system that is enslaving them. I'm sure we have all experienced that, at least in some of our friends and colleagues and neighbors and co-workers and the like. And uh, the Stockholm Syndrome is interesting to examine if for no, no other reason than it provides some sort of explanation for the otherwise inexplicable phenomenon of, for example, the 9 or 10 percent of the U.S. population that continues to approve of the work that Congress is doing, or the people who continue to defend Obama in the wake of him breaking every every major uh, electoral promise that he made back in the 2008 elections, or etc., etc., the people who stick up for the various systems of power that are so obviously inflicting such harm on them. And we are together in this societal uh, prison where we have been for generations and where people are slowly becoming conditioned to the idea that nothing they do has any relevance whatsoever on the structure of society, that they can vote this way or that way, they can uh, rally and petition and they can stage marches and protests and they can do this or that, but nothing's fundamentally going to change, that ultimately it's just a question of which side of the oligarchical left or right wing you want ruling over you, and that isn't much of a choice at all. And this creates a very, very depressing state of affairs for many people, and of course that is exactly the point. For those that they cannot capture with Stockholm Syndrome, which again only represents a sliver of the percentage of the population that is abducted, but for those that they can't capture with Stockholm Syndrome, they will capture with something that is referred to as learned helplessness. Uh, that is the process of being conditioned to the idea that nothing that you do matters, so that eventually you give up trying. And this is a phenomenon that I talked about in a episode of Corbett Report Radio that I would highly commend to listeners who have not heard that broadcast. It's Corbett Report Radio number 70, so of course I'll put the link in the show notes for today's episode so you can go and listen to it, where we document and define that phenomenon and talk about the ways that people can overcome that learned helplessness, which has been ingrained into us over the course of generations. And uh, I think that's very relevant to this discussion, as is my recent conversation that I had earlier this week with Thomas Sheridan about the concept of gaslighting. And that comes from a 1940 British film, which was based on a 1938 play called Gaslight, which is about the ways that psychological manipulators, psychopaths and others, can manipulate people into believing that they are crazy and thus becoming pliant and manipulable people. There are things to be said and that were said in both of those, uh, that broadcast and podcast about the ways that people can defend themselves from this phenomenon, but let's look in the context of the Stockholm Syndrome. People who have learned for some reason to love their servitude and learned that, well, there's not really anything we can do about it anyway, so we might as well enjoy our captivity uh, and just go along with it. And what do we say to that 
that idea, that phenomenon. Well, personally, I say that that phenomenon is essentially giving up. And once we give up, that is game over. That our true resistance lies in simply resisting the concept, the act of resisting. And of course, since we are dealing with a mental prison that has been constructed societally, that resistance has to be fundamentally mental in nature. It has to be as a decision that we make to live consciously in the knowledge that we are free and independent human beings who are not abduct abductees in a societal prison. We are free free people who can interact voluntarily and peacefully with those around us. And once we lose sight of that fact, then we start to become the abductees in this societal prison and become susceptible to Stockholm Syndrome and learned helplessness. So, at least part of what it means to actually resist in this, uh, in this system is to affect a change in consciousness. This is, of course, something that I've stressed over and over again in my work, because fundamentally, I think all of the solutions boil down to this in one way or another. And, of course, there are a lot of physical ways that we can practically implement that in our lives, and we've gone through that on this podcast numerous times, talking about alternative and complementary currencies, talking about the ways that people can get involved in community gardening and local farmers markets, talking about 3D printing and revolutionizing the idea of manufacturing, and, and all of the other ways that people can bring these solutions down to their local level and to take the power back into their own hands that have been that has been usurped to the, the would-be abductors of our society for far too long. But at the end of the day, it still comes back down to that fundamental consciousness, the understanding of ourselves, not as abductees in a societal prison, but as free human beings. And that, my friends, is the way out of this mental prison. That is the key that will open that barred door. And this is something that I had the chance recently to discuss with Adam Lane of Wu Wei Cafe. Uh, people might remember that he interviewed me once, uh, I believe a couple of years ago now, at least a year ago, year and a half ago perhaps, that is in the archives of CorbettReport.com. So of course I'll put a link into that previous conversation. And recently he interviewed me for a series that he's doing on his podcast talking about the idea of revolution and what revolution really means and how it can actually be achieved. And I was the first guest to be honored to appear in that series. Series. And so we had a very interesting discussion that has not been released yet, but you guys will know about it once it has been. It will be available uh, through the uh, Corbett Report, and I will make sure that you guys get that link. But in the meantime, I'd like to share a little bit of that conversation with you where we talked about this very idea of the cultural revolution, the, uh, the sorry, the consciousness revolution, which is the only real form of revolution and the only way out of this societal prison. Although I think it was uh, the Machiavellian idea that change needed to occur on a regular basis, at least um, superficially, so that, uh, you know, that, that appearance of a cycle, that appearance of um, a change, you know, it, it's kind of like when you uh, are voting for Obama a, a, instead of Bush, you know, uh, and the whole campaign is of change. It's, that is classic textbook Machiavelli in that, uh, you know, people need to see this happen. And so they even seem to be opposed, right? They seem to be, uh, oh, Obama is this smart, intellectual, you know, somewhat African-American <laughs> uh, who is going to change and bring hope. And, um, you know, it, uh, to me, when all that was happening, you know, I was kind of with the, the, the group that was saying, look, th this is... Uh, textbook uh, propaganda. He's he. he it's it's almost uh, the same speeches that were given in Germany, uh, with the whole uh, game plan I involved. You know, so people never questioned it then. They do now, I think, because he Obama has proven to be you know oh, worse than Bush in, in so many different ways, uh, especially his war record and. Um, uh, they realized that the change was simply a, a, a brand name change, and yet it's the same product or uh, new and improved. So that, that, that goes on and on and on. Um, See, so we really got to start looking at what, what actually causes change in society or what causes change in humanity. And, and uh, and go with it there, but until people start to recognize all the different types of um, 
manipulation that occurs, they're, they're, they're never going to even uh, be able to, to find a real change because they keep falling for the same tricks. They keep falling for the same, you know, prestidigitation over and over and over again. Well, the, the point that you raise is an important one. It's the idea that there is a sort of boiling point, and uh, once the society reaches that boiling point, there needs to be an escape valve of some sort. So some change has to occur. And of course, it can be completely window dressing change, but as long as it happens, the uh, the public can be placated for a little while longer. And I think that even that aspect of societal manipulation has been basically whittled down to a, a scientific craft in and of itself, judging at what stage of the boiling um, the, the public is at, how much of a release they're going to need, or whether this or that change will be the, the type of change that uh, will bring about that release, whether that will, uh, how long that will placate the society for. I think that there are, I mean, very, uh, very detailed studies into all of these aspects of, of human behavior. And, uh, and again, that's been going on for centuries. And, uh, and uh, uh, so I think that ultimately, you're exactly right, from time to time, there has to be some sort of change. That's what Machiavelli and others were pointing out. And, uh, and I think that uh, what what not only Huxley, but Russell and, and others writing in the mid-20th century were talking about is the ending of that, that era in which there has to be that cyclical change and the beginning of almost a different species. Um, I think that the, the long-term game plan is to create a, a sort of substrata of humanity that are just fit to be ruled, basically. And, and this was something that Bertrand Russell also wrote about specifically back in 1953. He wrote, uh, quote, scientific societies are as yet in their infancy. It is to be expected that advances in physiology and psychology will give governments much more control over individual mentality than they have now, even in totalitarian countries. Uh, Fichte laid it down that education should aim at destroying free will so that after pupils have left school, they shall be incapable throughout the rest of their lives of thinking or acting otherwise than as their schoolmasters would have wished. Diet, injections, and injunctions will combine from a very early age to produce the sort of character and the sort of beliefs that the authorities consider desirable, and any serious criticism of the powers that be will become psychologically impossible. And uh, the quotation I'm reading from ends there, but he goes on to say something like, uh, it would become uh, as, as impossible to imagine as uh, um, uh, sheep rising up against the practice of eating mutton. Um, basically, that in the future, the hum humanity will be dumbed down to s uh, such an extent that they will be actually psychologically incapable of of uh, rising up anymore, and that I, I that I think is is what's truly different. I mean, I think every generation has struggled with these these problems and these ideas, and I think we'd be naive to think that there hasn't been intelligent people in every generation who have understood um, to a certain extent what's going on here. But I think that what differentiates our time is this scientific progress towards the uh, the dumbing down of society and the creation of this substrata of humanity. And uh, we may be in one of the the last generations that is able to really and truly um, think our way out of this and to stop um, to stop what's happening. And unfortunately, the only, if the battlefield of this, this real um, test of, of whether revolution will take place, rebellion, fruitful revolution, whatever you want to call it, will take place, is in our mind, then all of this really comes down to our consciousness and our psyche and basically our ability to retain the ability to say no and to, and to, uh, to, to just simply stop complying with the system that's been slotted into place around us. And we are gradually losing that as we get further and further indoctrinated into the system. And, and to my mind, that's the real danger as we move further into the 21st century. Absolutely. Uh, that, that, that's exactly why on uh, my blog and various uh, work, I'm trying to find time to do as, as far as podcasting goes, my whole focus has been on consciousness you know, uh, first, you know, in my own life, how do I change my own consciousness? How do I release myself from um, from the influences that that direct how we decide things for ourselves? Now, I mean, uh, I I remember having a conversation with a bunch of people at one conference uh, on, on consciousness, and uh, one of the people there made a kind of a blanket statement. She says. I hear all this conspiracy talk about mind control and stuff. And she says, I don't know anybody who who's under any kind of mind control. And I said, Oh, really? That's interesting. Cause I've never met anyone who wasn't, <laughs> you know, myself included because mind control, if you think of it in, in the, in the 
just as under control, like you're a zombie who, who someone has a remote control for. Yeah. Okay. I don't know of anything that happens in that way. I'm sure they would love to have that, but uh, as far as influencing outcome and decision and behaviors, they, that is certainly um, programmed deeply into the entire aspect of civilization. I think from the beginning and right now, like you said, it's so advanced. Uh, you have uh, marketing campaigns that have a whole group of people watching their, their uh, commercials. They're not filling out forms like they used to do in the 30s, you know, or questionnaires with psychologically uh, uh, targeted questions. What they're doing is they're hooked to EEGs and MRIs, and, and they literally call it, you know, neurological marketing. So then they're looking to see exactly how uh, uh, that affects you, what part of your brain it affects and uh, how much of it, you know. So almost a commercial doesn't even have to have the product as long as they trigger the right uh, little uh, lights in your brain and then associate that to their brand. They're happy, you know. They really can get inside and under your skin without anybody knowing it, you know. And to me, I find that all the time... Um, even today, I'll start watching mainstream news somewhere, and it, at least uh, when I'm not really focused on it, I'll, I'll, I'll suddenly go, wait a minute, you know, I'm like believing the story here. I'm, I'm buying into the narrative, you know, instead of realizing that all I'm seeing is a present, presentation for my, um, uh, that, that is designed, you know, just for the effect it's, it can have, you know, it, it's, it's never going to be news. It's always going to be something that's programmed for a certain reaction, a certain effect. And I believe that goes, I mean, it might sound, I'm sure, very conspiratorial to a lot of people, but I think it goes completely across the board for all mainstream media. Once again, that's just a small sample from a very interesting con conversation that Adam Lane of Wu Wei Cafe conducted with myself a few days ago, and which will be spilling forth across the feeds shortly. So I hope you'll stay tuned to CorbettReport.com and or my Twitter feed for that conversation when it becomes available in its entirety. But in the meantime, I think I would like to wrap up today with a summary, not only of what we've learned, but of how we can actually apply this to our lives. What does it really mean to affect this revolution of consciousness, which I posit is the only way to really defeat this mental prison that we've been placed in to overcome the Stockholm Syndrome and the learned helplessness that so oppresses us? Well, I think there's not necessarily a one-size-fits-all answer to that question, but there are things that we can posit in the wake of that question. And I think one article that I came across quite recently that does a great job of putting this into perspective appeared on lourockwell.com just a few days ago. It is under the title, Withdrawing Consent Means More Than It May Seem. It is written by Michael S. Roseff, and I will read a part as follows. Quote, Withdrawing consent to the state means more than this innocuous phrase may suggest. To withdraw consent is far-reaching. It means a divorce from the state insofar as this is possible. It means having no loyalty to the state, seeing the state as fundamentally unfair and a source of continual injustices, being unwilling to help the state in any way, assuming and feeling no responsibility for the state's actions, and seeing the state as hostile to peace and society. It means a psychological divorce from feeling positive about or approving of its victories. It means working towards the state's opposite, that is, living together in freedom, friendship, comedy, and peace, i.e., in society. It means no longer thinking of oneself as a citizen, and not believing that as a citizen one has obligations towards the state or other citizens. Withdrawing consent from the state means not looking upon oneself as owning the state or influencing its activities or doing a sort of duty for the state. It means viewing the state as a nuisance. It means abandoning all forms of patriotism directed at the state and adherence to its symbols, parades, flags, pledges, songs, anthems, and, and monuments. It means no veneration of any political figure, past, present, or future. It means no veneration of the Constitution. It means as much as possible avoiding all interactions with government. Withdrawing consent does not mean being antisocial. Just the opposite. Going toward a natural order in society of life, freedom, and property is the natural law alternative to the state and its artificial legalistic order. Withdrawing consent can go much deeper than these changes. 
It can mean seeking out the underground economy, homeschooling, leaving the country, and avoiding the mainstream media interpretations. Withdrawn consent is actually a creative challenge to be met by many and varied individual techniques. It might be that a person boycotts movies that glorify the military. It surely means not supporting the troops and not pasting decals to that effect on one's car. It might mean educating others or counseling young men and women not to join the military and not to seek government jobs. The scope for withdrawn consent is broad. I cannot possibly say what all it involves. For me personally, withdrawn consent does not mean be being angry at the state, hating it, or turning to violence. I have never liked feeling either anger or hatred, and I try to eliminate them. I do not go around confronting state people intentionally or showing hostility to them. I feel that the state is winning if it gets to me. End quote. I like that article because I think it does draw out one of the key points of today's episode, which is that if there is a certain uh, percentage of the population that can be drawn into a loving relationship with the state, the more these the state draws itself into that abduct or abductee relationship, well, there is also the flip side of that. A certain percentage of the abductee population will hate their abductors and will strive against them and focus all of their energies on them, which of course creates a type of post-traumatic stress disorder in which the victim, the abductee, perpetually sees themselves in that position. They are the abductee, this is the abductor, and that all of their energies, all of their, their power, all of their thoughts, all of their actions must be directed toward that abductor. Well, in either event, whether it's Stockholm Syndrome or that type of hatred that is generated from the abductor-abductee relationship, still, all of one's focus goes towards the abductor, and they ultimately still have the upper hand in that relationship. It is only when we deconstruct that relationship, deny the very premise of the societal prison that we're living in, and deny the idea that we are abductees, and in fact affirm that we are nothing more and nothing less than absolute free individual human beings who have the free natural right to associate with whoever we want, in whatever way we want, however we want, whenever we want, in peaceful voluntary interactions, it is only then that we can truly escape the mental prison. And for all of those suffering from Stockholm Syndrome, well, obviously I would ask you to check your, your ideas and to check what is really happening in your relationship with those who are abducting you. For the uh, majority of my audience, who I'm assuming is probably not in that Stockholm Syndrome category, but may be uh, affected by learned helplessness and other forms of abuse that are reflected by abductors upon abductees, I ask you to simply consider the idea of withdrawing consent and the mental choice that we make to live as slaves in, and abductees in a societal prison, or to live as free human beings. And it is a choice that we make every day by the way that we perceive ourselves and the way we act in the world. So there is much more to say about this matter, obviously, and we will continue to say it on this podcast going forward from here. But I think that'll be it for today. So I'm going to leave you there for now. Once again, asking you to continue doing this research on your own. And of course, you can use the show notes for today's episode as a starting point for that research. I am James Corbett of CorbettReport.com thanking you for joining me for this week's episode and asking you to join me again next week. The Corbett Report is brought to you by The Corbett Report subscriber. A weekly newsletter featuring James Corbett's International Forecaster Editorial, recommended reading and viewing, discounts on Corbett Report DVDs, and once a month, a subscriber-only video. Sign up today to start receiving your copy at corbettreport.com support.